Hey witches, Tiffany here on Bewitching Bemused, if you don't already know me. Today we are going to cover an introduction to scrying, what it is, how to do it, and different methods of scrying. I want to give a big shout out and say thank you to Susan from Germany for requesting this topic. It is going to be a pretty fun one to do. I think most people's exposure to scrying is crystal ball gazing, thanks to pop culture and media and Hollywood. And while yes, crystal ball gazing is one type of scrying, there are several other types as well. Additionally, this practice is not quite as straightforward as Hollywood would make you think, looking into it and seeing a whole scene play out before your eyes. It's, you know, I mean, it's never, it's never that straightforward in whether you're talking about divination or you're talking about magic, things are never that easy <laughs> as it is in Hollywood. Um, however, I would say usually in Hollywood they depict that you have to go to a medium, you have to go pay a psychic to have this done, and I would argue that just about anybody could do this if you're willing to put in the time, patience, and practice that it requires. All right, I already kind of started touching on this. What is scrying? Scrying is a divination technique that requires gazing at an object or a surface. It is typically a reflective surface, although this is not necessarily required. And you do this in order to observe images and symbols that you will later interpret to find meaning in. Scrying can be done as a form of communication with spirit. And as always, when I say spirit, I mean the uppercase S general spirit that to you could be deity, it could be ancestors, it could be land spirits. There's lots of different um, entities, I suppose, that you could use uh, to communicate with or that I like to lump in under that term uppercase S spirit. Um, it's also a form of just general divination that you can use for guidance or to ask questions. Scrying as a form of divination has been practiced in various different cultures and countries and regions for centuries. It can be found in various different texts, anything from Hamlet by Shakespeare to the Hebrew Bible. When it comes to how to actually scry, I just really want to be clear that there is no singular form. Like I said, this has been practiced for very long, a very long time in various different places, in various different ways. There's a ton of different methods and there's no singular formula to practicing this, this form of divination. There is also no single formula that is used for reading and interpreting the symbols and images that are going to come up during scrying. Like I mentioned earlier, this is a practice that is going to take time, patience, and practice to kind of get it down. You will have to experiment and sort of find your own rhythm as you go, but don't worry, throughout the video I will be offering various different suggestions. So the first thing that you want to do is of course set the stage. I recommend scrying only when you have time and space to not be interrupted. You know, you want to silence your phone and put yourself, get ready to put yourself in a position that you can maintain comfortably for a long period of time. So I wouldn't recommend some sort of like vigorous yoga pose or or, you know, if it was me, eh, sometimes if I lay down, I might start to get sleepy and maybe doze off. So I personally like a seated position. Again, this is entirely up to you, though. Also, if I'm carrying any excess unwanted energy that I feel like is going to keep me kind of anxious or nervous or a little too bubbly, uh, you know, just not able to relax, then I will spend some time grounding and centering before I begin. Also, if you are the type of practitioner that likes to call upon sacred space or circle or call on the directions as a form of protection before you do any kind of working, you would want to do that now. Scrying does require you to enter a trance-like state. So I do want you, when you're setting the stage, to consider what helps you get really relaxed um, helps you meditate and helps you trance out essentially. So there might be some essential oils that you like to dab on certain places on your skin. You might have a particular incense you like to burn. You'll also want to consider what kind of music you want playing, if any at all. You instead may just want to have white noise playing in noise canceling headphones or just noise canceling headphones with nothing playing at all. And another thing to consider is your lighting. Now, Lighting you may want to experiment with a bit because what works for you uh, for meditation and getting into trance may not work as well for seeing in this regard, right? So <laughs> you, for me, I like to meditate during dawn as the sun is coming up and yes, it's dim, but it's still pretty bright out usually. 
For scrying, I prefer to work in a completely dark room that is just lit by candlelight. Part of it is just going to depend on personal preference, but also part of it is going to depend on what's your eyesight like and how well do you want things to be in focus. Uh, so for instance, I usually, I'm far, I'm nearsighted, sorry, so I can see close up, not far away. Um, I don't wear contacts or um, glasses if I am scrying. I think that being slightly out of focus, usually I work with my, um, you can see my obsidian orb back here. That's often what I use to scry with. Sometimes a mirror and I keep it generally close. So it's not like my vision is that warped when I'm doing this um, when without wearing glasses. I will touch on vision a little bit more later, but it is just enough to kind of make things just out of focus that it does help me start to see things um, easier. And I find that the dimmer lights also help with that. But some people might find that they're having a harder time working with a reflective surface in a dimmer light. So again, that's just something you're going to want to experiment with and see what works best for you. So the next thing you need to do is enter trance or an altered state of consciousness. The practice of gazing and scrying will require you to enter a relaxed trance-like state. So I've talked about trance-like states before. Oftentimes you can achieve this through an inhibitory uh, practice or through excitatory means. And I would not recommend excitatory means such as singing, chanting, dancing, exercise, anything like that, because it's just going to be really hard to maintain for lengthy periods of time. Those are good for like quick one-offs. If you're trying to charge a sigil really fast, you just build yourself up to that high and boom, charge it. This is a trance-like state that you are going to want to kind of maintain and stay in for a while. It depends on the person. Some people may stay in it for 10 minutes. I I've managed to kind of keep the scrying session going for over an hour. It really depends what you're looking to get out of the session and how experienced you are. I would say the newer you are, probably the longer it's going to take. Um, so I would recommend maybe uh, meditation is the number one that I would recommend. That's my own personal preference for scrying as well, is meditating to get into a trance-like state. The gazing itself can also be used to achieve a trance-like state. So I sort of begin with meditation and then right when I'm on the cusp, I kind of slip into the gazing. So it's sort of an easier transition because I like to meditate with my eyes closed. So if I start meditating with my eyes closed and I get into a trance-like state and then I open them, it can kind of be a little jarring. So I like to kind of like slowly open them right when I'm just about there and then start the gazing process. And that will kind of get my mind into that altered state of consciousness where I need it to be. I have also had the opportunity to take hallucinogenic drugs and then try uh, scrying during that experience. Now, usually I didn't take the drugs <laughs> with the sole intention of scrying. There's usually more involved than that, um, you know, activities planned for the day. Um, and I also can't say that I necessarily recommend it uh, just for any legal purposes and, and whatnot, but that is, I'm just putting it out there into the world. That is another way to induce a trance-like state, of course. The next part, if you're not already doing it, is you are going to begin gazing at your object or your um, surface. And don't worry, when I keep saying object, surface, I'm going to touch on those after this section. Your mind should be completely clear and relaxed. Your body should be relatively relaxed and your vision should be relaxed as you gaze at this object or in this surface that you are cho you've chosen for scrying. You should really just allow your body and your, well, basically your eyes and your eye muscles to kind of just work however feels most natural, as long as they are staying relaxed. So yes, they might sort of scan over the surface um, or they might just hold steady in one spot. Just allow whatever happens to happen. And sometimes, you know, your vision might go double, your eyes might cross a little bit. Or like I mentioned a moment ago, um, I already like to start off working with my eyes a little bit out of focus. They might start to go even more out of focus and it might kind of go in and out. Once again, as long as it is not completely obscuring your vision and as long as your eyes are maintaining relaxation and it's not distracting you in any way, this is all perfectly fine and perfectly normal. Be patient. That's a big part. It may take a little time before you kind of start seeing things and it may all um, come at you at once and then just stop and that's it. Session's over. Um, it could be that one thing kind of shows up 
and then it takes a while and then another thing shows up and then it takes a while. This is going to depend on a couple of different things, right? So first is going to be your experience, but it's also going to depend on who you're communicating with as well and what their communication style is. Take note of every single image and every single symbol that appears to you. Whether it's something really obvious like a key or a cow or the sun, right? Or something a little bit more ambiguous like it's a bird but you're not really sure what kind of bird it is or if it's a brand new symbol, just something that you've never seen before or you don't recognize, take note of everything and allow everything to appear before you without judgment. If you start to have other thoughts that begin cropping up, just take a deep breath and let them go. Um, now this could be something you wanna take note of later. You wanna examine what thought cropped up with what visual image or it could just be something that your mind is interfering on and it could muddy the waters of what you're seeing and or how you interpret what you're seeing later. I will get back to recording everything that you see and the interpretation of that in just a moment, but I also wanna say in regards to gazing, if you're using a reflective surface, it might feel like the most natural thing in the world to stare directly at yourself, to look yourself right in the eye as you're doing this. But I do recommend that you avoid that and try keeping yourself more in your peripheral if possible. So you might wanna stare above your head or over one shoulder. And also, especially in the beginning, it might be easiest if you're doing this with like a blank wall behind you or hang up a sheet or whatever it takes. You know, this that I have in my background might be a little bit too busy if I were just starting out and I was seeing you know, all these things reflected in the background. In regards to not staring at yourself though, you may have heard, heard superstitions of, you know, light a candle in a dark room and stare at your reflection for this many minutes and you'll see, you know, your soulmate. You'll see yourself from your past life. You'll see your spirit guide and what they look like. The reality of this is there is a scientific explanation behind that. Your brain and your eyes essentially get bored of looking at the same thing after a few minutes, about five to 10 minutes. And it your brain starts to change your perception of what you're seeing. So you will actually see your face start to morph. Now, this is a fun trick. It's, it's kind of a cool optical illusion that you can practice, you know, on your own or with your friends, or, or it might be a good way to start the practice of gazing and getting into trance. It's an interesting way to do that, but keep that in mind. It's just practice. At the end of the day, there's scientific reasoning behind it and there's nothing spiritual about it as far as what I can tell in my experience and my research. So again, avoid looking directly at yourself and try somewhere in the peripheral on either side of either shoulder or above your own head. You could even try like if you, you know, if you have like a blank t-shirt on or something, stare directly at your chest. That's fine too. I would just avoid looking directly into your face. As for recording, uh, I did say to make note. Now, whether you want to do this while you're gazing or if you want to just kind of hang on to it all and record it afterward is going to depend on a few things. One of which is your memory. Uh, the other thing is whether or not you're going to be distracted by taking notes. Also, can you avoid, can you take notes over here without looking away from your focus? You might also want to try audio recording and just say it out loud what you're seeing and then jot that down later or, you know, I mean, verbal journaling is a thing as well if that's what's easiest for you. Um, just make sure no matter what that you do create some sort of record for later interpretation and you want to try to get it as accurate as possible. Um, so keeping things in the order that they appeared in. When it comes to interpretation, this is another thing that I cannot really tell you how to do. And I have touched on this uh, many, many times before. I will link different things down below uh, my video on interpreting your dreams and my articles on my article on why you should pick your own magical correspondences. Because when you look at sympathetic magic, magical ingredients for a spell, magical correspondences, um, those are just symbols. Those ingredients are just symbols, right? And so they match the intention of what it is you're trying to manifest, or they represent something involved in on the real world level of what you're trying to manifest on the ritual level, right? So it's all very subjective and it depends on your religion, your culture, your socioeconomic background. 
um, your sexual orientation, your gender, um, what country you're from. Uh, did you live in multiple countries? You know, uh, even just your individual experiences and memories. Additionally, and this also goes for correspondences as well, when you look at tables of symbols and, and charts and books of these things, a lot of them, you know, no two are alike very often, very, very often no two are alike. There are a few symbols that are very universal. For instance, the heart, right? The heart, it symbolizes, it looks nothing like your actual beating heart, <laughs> but we all know that that's what it means. And we all know that it also symbolizes love, but most symbols are not that clear cut across the board. So if you go out and buy one book of symbols, don't be surprised if you go and look at a second book of symbols and the definitions for the exact same thing are completely different. What I recommend you do is spend time journaling and or meditating on each symbol um, that appeared to you while you were scrying. Again, like I said many, many times already, this is a practice of patience. Think of how it relates to, maybe you had a particular question in mind. Think about how it relates to that question. Think about how you felt when that image popped up for you. How were you feeling in the moment? Also, how did it make you feel? Did it make you think any particular thought? Did it make you, you know, summon up any particular memories? Really sit and think on what this particular symbol means to you. Even now, maybe a memory didn't pop up at the time that it appeared before you, but maybe now that you're thinking on it, you're meditating, you're journaling, maybe it is making you think of a particular memory. How did you feel during that time? What kind of an impact did this, <laughs> you know, maybe you saw a, a giraffe in, in, your, in your scrying and you have a memory of feeding a giraffe at the zoo. You know, how did you feel in that moment? What do you feel now thinking about that moment? There's lots of different ways to start working on interpreting these things. It's going to take a lot of time and practice though. So please be patient with yourself. It is a worthy pursuit and it will come quicker as you continue to practice. Additionally, if you were contacting spirit, again, whether that's deity, whether that's ancestor, whether that's land spirits, whether that's a spirit that lives in your home, um, if you know them or you're familiar with them, think of what these symbols may have meant to them. Think on or do the research on to discover how they would have used these symbols to communicate with you and to answer your questions or, or give you guidance. Finally, for interpretation, this may be a little bit more difficult in the beginning, but as you become more and more practiced, it'll be easier as you go, but you will want to focus on the more minute details. So say you saw a bird. Okay, was it perched or was it in flight? What color was it? Was it dead or alive? What type of bird was it? Could you tell the gender? Could you tell the age? If you saw the moon, what phase was it in? Was it hanging over the ocean? Was it high in the sky? Was it obscured by cloud cover or was it completely clear? I know for me, a full moon is gonna have a very different symbolic meaning than a new moon. Just like a crow is gonna have a very different symbolic meaning for me than a parrot or a finch. And again, it's okay if sometimes these are not that clear. Maybe all you can tell is it is some sort of bird of prey, right? Maybe that's all you can really tell. That is perfectly fine. Just write down what you've got. The details will become more and more clear to you as you practice. And sometimes the details are not meant to be clear to you. So keep that in mind as well. Sometimes the message is meant to be ambiguous, whether that's because the meaning is a more general one and less specific, or because maybe it's just not something that you're meant to have the full and complete answer to right now, or the outcome is sort of undetermined and it's a little bit up in the air. Okay, finally, let's move on to scrying methods. So I already mentioned uh, using the crystal ball, right? I do want you to keep in mind though, while the crystal ball is so much fun to use, like I said, I've got one myself that I use very often. Um, it does not have to be a sphere. It does not have to be a ball at all. And also in the movies, they often are, um, you can see right through them, they're clear, right? Mine's opaque. I love working with an opaque one. So that is also completely up to you. Another common tool is mirrors for scrying. Now you can use a regular mirror or you can also use a black mirror. That one is actually very popular if you're kind of looking into um, 
Western occultism practices. So that's often done by using um, like an obsidian disc. Um, but what you can also do is just take a picture frame and insert black construction paper into it and then use the glass on the um, on the picture frame as your reflective surface. Then there is water scrying, which is it, okay, it's not more complex, but there's a lot more variety, right? So the easiest way that you can do it, and this is also great if you have very little little or limited tools to be working with, all you got to do is put some water in a bowl. That's it. And look right down into it. It's that easy. Tap water works perfectly fine, but it's also fun to work with different types of water. So um, perhaps like full moon water or something like that. Natural water in a lake, a river, the ocean is also another great way to practice water scrying. In addition to working with the, the images that you're going to find either in the reflective surface or in sort of that abyss, right? The abyss of the depths of the water. Um, there's going to be those visuals, but you can also work with the movement of the water because you will find symbols and images cropping up to you in that as well. And if you're interested in doing that with a bowl of water, all you have to do is kind of top, tap, tap, to, to tap the top of it to create a ripple effect and examine those. Another fun thing to do with a bowl of water is to dribble some candle wax or um, oil into it. And you can kind of read the globules or you can also just use them as a focus. The final suggestion that I have for water scrying is to work with ice. Now, of course, you can work with a large frozen body of water. You can work with a frozen bowl of water or you can fill a water balloon with water, pop it in the freezer, and then just cut away the water balloon. Next is fire scrying. This can be done with anything from a little tiny tea light flame to a huge crackling bonfire. Again, the flames, both the light of it and the movement is a really easy way to kind of lose yourself and lose your vision in what you're looking at. And it's also a really, really, for me anyway, I find that watching flames, especially a bigger flame like a fireplace or a bonfire, is a really easy way to get into a trance, uh, you know, get into an altered state of consciousness. The only thing that I will warn with this one is that, at least in my experience, um, your eyes may become more tired quicker because not only is it staring directly into a source of light, but also if you are working with a larger fire, the heat might start to kind of dry out your eyes as well. A workaround for this that might help you be able to gaze a little bit longer is to keep the fire in your peripheral. So much like when staring at, you know, or I should say not staring at your own reflection, you can look around the edges of the fire or maybe at the ground just in front of the fire above it to the sides, whatever you have to do that keeps it kind of in your peripheral. So it's not as bright and ugh. you can also, instead of using the fire directly, use the shadows that the fire is casting or use the smoke that is coming off the fire, which does bring us to smoke scrying. Another benefit of smoke scrying is that if you don't want to work with the open flame or you can't, you can't have an open flame, you can do this with incense. And again, it creates a nice focus to help you kind of zone out, reach that trans state, have something to focus on and stare at to sort of begin to get your visuals. Um, but in addition to that, you can also interpret the meanings of the swirls of the smoke as it rises. This is another one that I would recommend, especially in the beginning, if you're going to work with it, have it set up in front of a blank wall or some sort of blank surface. If you're staring at the smoke and there's a lot of kind of busyness in the far background behind it, that can be very distracting in, in the beginning. Eventually you'll just be able to scry wherever, whenever, no matter the conditions for the most part, of course. Um, but for now it is good to help yourself work with those more blank surfaces just to maintain your focus. And finally, although by all means there are tons more out there, and if you guys have an interesting way of scrying that I did not touch on and you want to share it below, please do. I would love to hear how you prefer to scry uh, down below in the comments. But finally, there is cloud scrying. And I'm sure we're all familiar, familiar with, you know, kicking back on the grass and just watching the clouds go by and finding different shapes in the clouds. This is yet another one that the actual action of it can get you into that trance state. You can also see the physical shapes and the physical movements of the clouds and interpret those. And I also, oh man, um, especially when it's mostly a clear day and you're just getting kind of clouds passing by intermittently, 
and it's mostly blue skies, just whew, staring directly into the blue sky, personally, I find to be to work really, really well for scrying. You just have to kind of tune out any uh, like eye floaters because <laughs> I see those very, very easily when staring into the blue sky. But once you can kind of tune those out and just focus, allow yourself to reach that trance state, um, the blue sky and clouds are very, very useful for scrying. As always, this is in article format. I've linked it down below in the description box if it makes it easier for you to follow along with the instructions. If you are looking for more information on how to interpret your own personal symbols, check out my video on how to interpret dreams. Thank you.